All right. Yeah. So, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, you know, this is the much more free form section of the workshop. Uh, we have about 50 minutes here uh, where we're just going to you know, take some time, run through, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, any questions that you may have, uh, any, if you want to talk about anything in particular, sort of, this is the, the programmer space. So, uh, you know, anything you want to chat about is a okay by me, uh, feel free to, to interrupt at any point and ask questions. Um, but, you know, that said, I'm going to hand it over first to, uh, to Amy, um, Nabeen, uh, Dennis, uh, Inc., and Anav, who are going to be running through a few of the particulars on Fathom GPT. So, um, so yeah, um, it's super exciting. And uh, thanks, thanks to you all for, uh, for presenting. And I'll hand it off to you. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so uh, our system, the uh, Fathom GPT, is um, it's an application that allows uh, the user to interact with the Fathomnet uh, website uh, using a uh, large language model so that they can uh, use uh, the natural language prompts to access the data or images from Fathomnet. So the overall uh, architecture of our system is that there's a front end which uh, gets the user prompt and also ends up displaying the uh, data. So the front end, once it has the user prompt, it passes to the back end, which uh, has the components of a uh, name resolution using Worms and Wikipedia. The, the uh, SQL uh, database uh, that was pulled from Fastnet containing the images and other uh, creature data. And it also uses the uh, OpenAI uh, API to uh, understand the user prompt and determine which functions to call. <clears throat> so the uh, current features that uh, we support are uh, allowing the user to retrieve images and other data from Fathomnet, and it can also uh, resolve scientific names uh, from the common name or description. It can generate visualizations using data from Fathomnet, and it can also search by image. So the uh, backend architecture uh, is, um, so once the query comes from the front end, it would uh, use uh, GPT 3.5 to uh, determine which functions to call. So for example, if it doesn't have a scientific name, it will need to do scientific, scientific name resolution. And uh, it would also, uh, if it's asking for image data or other data from Fastnet, it would do uh, SQL uh, query generation. And there are also other uh, functionalities like taxonomy or like uh, visualization, or it could just fall back to ChatGPT to get it to answer the prompt directly. So for the SQL query uh, generation, uh, it uh, has three different types. So there are there's the image search from Fathomnet. There's also a visualization which uh, gets data from Fathomnet that it will pass to the uh, poly code generator to create a graph. And there are also a few other uh, uh, queries from to the Fastnet data. So for once it uh, gets the SQL query, it would execute that on the uh, on our Fastnet uh, database, and it would uh, get the uh, response and uh, format it as a JSON to pass into the front end to display. So the uh, name resolution step is uh, the step that happens before the SQL generation if it's required. So for example, if the prompt uh, contains a common name or a description of a creature, it would map that to the scientific names. So this would allow the user to uh, ask questions to Fathom GPT that even if uh, they don't know the actual scientific name of the creature. So for example, they can ask uh, find me images of wind jelly it's a common name, and they would be able to resolve that to already or it has a scientific name. Or they could uh, simply ask for uh, images based on a description of the creature, for example, creatures with tentacles, and it will be able to get a, a list of the scientific names of creatures that match that description. So the uh, uh, Worms database, which is uh, used in the first step of the uh, name resolution, is uh, used for the common name to scientific name uh, matching. So this would uh, contain a mapping or a dictionary of uh, common names to a list of the scientific names that uh, fit that common name. So for this example, the rat tail is a common name of a type of fish, and it would uh, map to a list of uh, scientific names of rat tails. 
so this is the first type of uh, name resolution I will try. And if it's unable to find a, a scientific name, it would go uh, to the uh, next uh, step, which is KG name, uh, or knowledge graph uh, name resolution. So this is uh, used for uh, resolving a description of a creature to the list of scientific names, uh, unlike the previous one, which is for common name to scientific name. So uh, the knowledge graph uh, name resolution is, um, it uses KGs are generated from Wikipedia data for all of the concepts in FathomNet. And it would also generate a knowledge graph of the prompt from the user. And it would do graph alignment uh, between the two KGs to uh, determine which uh, species ma uh, match the user prompt. And uh, if it's unable, still unable to find a scientific name from uh, this uh, attempt, then it would uh, use the fallback methods, which are uh, the uh, plain text uh, unstructured string matching from the Wikipedia data using tokens from a prompt. So uh, this is an example of uh, a species KG that they use for the uh, name resolution. So in this case, we have the scientific name, Aurea Gorita, which uh, contains the following features. And each uh, feature has the uh, different a list of values that apply to this species. And uh, in this uh, file, it will save uh, something similar to this for all of the uh, concepts in PASMNET. So uh, the current uh, features that uh, it supports are body parts, colors, parameter prey relationships, and uh, the environment of the creature. So if it's not one of those features, then it would fall back to the uh, the uh, unstructured text matching method. So for example, here's an example of uh, searching by the body part, color fins. It would return uh, images of uh, fish which have color fins. And here's an example of searching by color. So it will show images of uh, orange creatures. Uh, or it could do uh, predators of moon jelly, which are mola mola. Or it could find creatures from tropical seas, which is searching by the environment. And it would return uh, the uh, creatures that uh, correspond to that description. So the uh, knowledge graph uh, generation process uh, happens uh, in the uh, pre-processing pre -processing stage. So it's not real time. We uh, just uh, generate all of the knowledge graphs from the concepts and we save that into a JSON list so that it's faster to access. So this uh, is implemented by um, first pulling all of the Wikipedia pages for um, all of the concepts in FASMNET. And it will then instruct the uh, GPT 3.5 to uh, to extract various features from that Wikipedia data using a prompt uh, listed here. So for example, it would ask GPT 3.5, what are the, uh, let's say, colors of Aurelia Aurita and give the uh, Wikipedia text of, uh, of Aurelia Aurita in this example. And uh, it would be able to fetch a structured uh, JSON list of uh, the um, feature and the values of that feature. And it would do that for uh, all the features that it supports and all of the concepts in PASMNET to get the final uh, knowledge graph of all of the uh, concepts. And uh, the other knowledge graph that we generate is is uh, the uh, the uh, user prompt. So for this one, this will happen in real time since it depends on the user input. And uh, this would uh, prompt GPT 3.5 to uh, generate a subject relation object triple of that user prompt. So for example, predators of moon jelly, the prompt would uh, generate uh, this uh, structured uh, data and orange creatures would generate something like that. So once we have the two knowledge graphs, we can do KG alignment to do the name resolution. So uh, this happens uh, by uh, first uh, doing semantic matching between the relation in the prompt KG. So for example, in this case, it will be color or predators. And it would uh, see if it matches one of the available features. And if it does match, then we can use 
PHP name resolution. And if it doesn't, it will fall back to the uh, the unstructured text methods. So if it does match, then it would uh, then either find the matching subject or the matching object between the pump KG and the species KG. So um, for example, in this case, it's matching the subject for the parameters of moon jelly. So uh, the first step is that it sees that the relation parameters is one of the supported features. And then it uh, finds the uh, the uh, concept that uh, has moon jelly as either the alias or the scientific name. So in this case, it finds it here. So it's able to uh, return a list of the parameters of moon jelly, which is this list right here. And uh, the other way is the object matching. So similar to the previous one, it first uh, matches the relation colors to the available features. And it uh, matches the object uh, transparent to one of the uh, the elements in the list of colors. So uh, in this case, Aurelia Orita has transparent color, so it's able to return the scientific name Aurelia Orita. And it will also do that for all the other uh, concepts that uh, contain transparent as the color. So uh, yeah, so we have several scripts to uh, do the name resolution, uh, the knowledge graph generation. So the script to pull the Wikipedia data to generate the knowledge graphs and also to generate the vector embeddings of the relation to future name uh, matching. And uh, currently we have some limitations. For example, it's not able to um, uh, match when there are multiple descriptors in the prompt. So for example, if we want to find something that is both orange and has te tentacles, then it's currently not supported yet. And it's also only working for the uh, list of the available features that were was uh, listed. And otherwise it wouldn't uh, use this method. And it's also um, not completely robust. For example, it depends on LLM to generate the prompt KG, which is non-deterministic and could be also very affected by the phrasing of the prompt. So if it's phrasing correctly, it might not generate the knowledge graph correctly to do the name resolution. So yeah, those are some uh, areas that we still need to work on. And I guess I'll pass it to uh, Naveen for the SQL generation part. Uh, Oh, Naveen, I think you're on mute. Sorry, for some reason, my Zoom application just like hangs up once I start a second start trains here. So you can see my screen, right? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the screen generation. So we had some technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. but, um, no worries at all. Thanks for the backup, Amy. Sorry, my laptop is, I don't know what happens. So uh, let's go through the SQL generation and the output generation process. Um, so uh, once the name resolution is done, uh, yes. uh, once the name resolution is done, uh, let's, let's not say, So once the name resolution is done, uh, the control goes to the SQL the SQL generation function. Uh, if the if the query requires SQL generation, so um, um so 
during that we also get the output type based on the input prompt so uh, the uh, the prompt may be asking for images or tables or text or a visualization uh, and um, that gets passed to uh, the SQL generation function through the open a functional calling feature and based on the output type we are processing the three different outputs separately uh, and uh, we, we found out like if uh, everything is done with like with us with a single fine-tuned model then the output uh, would the SQL generation would get more complex uh, and the SQL output would also look uh, very complex for even some simple prompts. So we took this approach. So um, uh, so now let's talk about the output type. Uh, so since we need to generate the output in a human readable format, so uh, we need to we need to understand what the output is before like we we design the architecture so first we can see the output type is um, there is a text and there should be like four types of output contents and uh, uh, for that we need um, to decide the architecture and how we process them how we can generate the data and fine tune the model earlier so uh, so the first type is a text prompt to images, text tables, and uh, we are using OpenAI's GPT 3.5 Turbo fine tune model, and uh, we are few sorting it, and um, and the SQL uh, that gets generated from the model is run and uh, and it's attached to the JSON. Uh, once we get the result from the data and from the database, we are also uh, forcing the model to generate the output text that. And that and just generates a text in a human like uh, in in a readable format to the user. So now let's talk about GPT three point five GPT three point five. Uh, although there are many disadvantages like right now, um, we could see even in the demo that uh, there were uh, the once the uh, once we once we input different prompts and get different results the. Uh, the token context would and to, the token length would get uh, big and there would be error. So uh, although GPT 3.5 has a smaller context length, uh, uh, in the previous version we found that the uh, when using GPT 4, the time that it would take uh, to generate a response was too much. So uh, that uh, that's a trade off. Uh, that we took uh, with GBT 3.5 and also it can be fine-tuned. We don't have uh, access to fine-tuning GBT 4 right now. And uh, also since we are falling back to GBT 4, one, if the SQL generation process gives an error or there is some uh, error within the SQL generated, uh, then we use GBT 4. And uh, why do we need to fine-tune the model is like, uh, uh, like um why how how do we find you in the model is uh, it's not the normal ml approach it's just going through the uh open ai api so what we do is just create the input prompts and the ex expected results that we want from the model so we just create a list of those prompts and input that in a JSONL format file and just send it to the open ai api and the open api determines all the hyperparameters uh, all epochs or um, other hyperparameters and uh, right now we saw that uh, for uh, type 1 type output it it takes two epochs and uh, for type 2 output it takes three epochs uh, when we just increase the epochs the response does and uh, does still to our use cases, but the SQL generation, uh, SQL code gets a bit uh, like uh, it, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't remember a column name or like then there is some, there will be some slight uh, differences in the actual column name and the column name that the SQL is uh, referring to, and that creates some, uh, that creates a lot of errors. So. Uh, so that's why we are fine tuning the GPT three point five model, and um, uh, also, uh, also we we are also um, using 
we we are finding in the model uh, for a use case like this for example we want to search uh, the mazes from a specific location and what happens is the gpd model has data about this about the location within itself so for example uh, if we search uh, a location it's it, it's gonna out input the latitude longitude coordinates by itself um, since it already has the data uh, already has the data that's trained into it so uh, we want the SQL, sql query to use our uh, regions table since we already have that table in our uh, database so uh, um, so uh, like to help the model better understand our data base structure we are fine-tuning the model and um, for even the output text formatting that we are using um, it was seen uh, the uh, response were better when we use uh, fine-tuned model and also when the tables had some generic name the LLM would just go through the uh, that table rather than the actual table. For example, uh, the table right now has, uh, the database right now has a table in tags and it has keys and values pairs and the LLM would just uh, out, uh, would just uh, set the value. For example, uh, if we are searching for species, it would just uh, set the value, uh, set the key, key and set the value value from that table uh, in the SQL query. So uh, that's not what we expected. Like we want it uh, to use the correct uh, table right now. It would be the bounding box table. So uh, for that also, we are fine tuning the model so that the uh, model understands the database better. And uh, what, we, what we have seen during the fine tuning process is that we can uh, almost craft the conversation between us and the LLM. For example, right now we are doing everything in one step, like um, we don't, and the user doesn't have a say when, like for example, we are searching for species uh, given, its, uh, given its common name uh, on a certain place, then first uh, it just goes through the scientific name uh, resolution and goes through uh, the SQL generation in one go, like we, we could, fine tune the model so that uh, that uh, so the model just uh, stops uh, once the scientific resolution part is done and it just says like uh, okay uh, are these scientific names correct and should i continue or something like that so we could almost craft the conversation with the fine tuned data and we are expecting a lot of prompts from um uh, from like uh, from the research scientists so that uh, the model can be uh, fine-tuned in a way that uh, the users are expecting the response. So now let's go through the output text formatting. This is one of the optimizations that we did earlier. We What we did was uh, just the, the output text would uh, go through another uh, LLM chain, another uh, OpenAI, Function, uh, function, fee, uh, function calling feature and it would uh, just summarize the response. Uh, uh, so uh, in this new version, we are just uh, generating the uh, text so that the data can be formatted within the text, uh, within the response, the output text. So for example, in this query, the, uh, the when running this query, we can get the concept uh, from uh, as a result of this query and what we do is the python plot python code just uh, inputs the data to this uh, output text uh, instead of uh, instead of sending it to the chat gpt model again and summarizing the response so uh, this would be the example and so this is our prompt structure. We the LLM has our database structure. We have we've sorted the LLM so that the output is uh, on and like everything is um, as we expected. Uh, and that's the first type. And now let's go to the second type. We are uh, for the second type. We are uh, we want the user and user to provide a prompt and and input image and get get similar images based on the input prompt and the uploaded image. 
So uh, for this, we have used another fine tune model. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, the 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 reason for that is uh, I've already said that. But the other reason is the the prompt structure itself is different. Uh, in the first structure, we don't have uh, to compute the similarity score. Uh, but uh, in this, we do need the similarity score so that uh, the 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 similarity between the images that uh, similarity between the user's input and the output uh, user's input and the input uh, and the data from the database can be computed. So um, so currently the model is expecting the similarity store score is already computed and uh, this uh, the bottom part is just the um just the uh, uh, code that the model generates uh, and the top part is already computed pre-computed by us based on the user's input input data response so uh, this would be our data flow uh, so we first get the user image and generate a feature vector uh, then uh, then uh, the fine tune model will just generate us a uh, uh, query and we just uh, feed the feature vector to our pre program SQL and we just merge the pre program SQL and SQL generated by the model and generate a response and send that to the user. Uh, for the for the feature vector, right now we are using efficient net. Uh, we found that um, vision transfer work uh, works better on our data. Uh, we did a preliminary analysis, analysis for uh, earlier, but uh, at that time we thought uh, if it was working better. But uh, once we once we ran uh, the uh, the models on all of the data in our data set, and then uh, we saw this that vision transfer works much better. Uh, we will uh, we will change like uh, we will swap the feature vectors soon enough. Like. We, Within few days, and um, so, um, so the uh, cosine similarity is uh, is just calculated using this Microsoft logs implementation, uh, and it's pretty fast. It takes uh, around three seconds, and um, and we have also started the we have also started fine tuning of uh, vision transformer and efficient B seven model, but still. Uh, um, it's uh, it it was started like a week ago, and we don't have any results to show right now. Uh, and uh, for uh, let's talk about the third type output. So this is the visualization the output that we uh, we are expecting the user will uh, want from the uh, from the Fathom GPT uh, interface. And for the visualization output, uh, we aren't using a uh, fine tune model yet. Um, we just want a lot of data from the user so that like every type of visualization uh, and um, so what we saw was uh, user can phrase the uh, phrase the visualization differently and there can be errors uh, like and the response like could, could have been different so what we can do is uh, like find in the model uh, similarly how we did for the type one output and uh, make it um, make it better for all type of user prompt structures. So uh, that's uh, something that we need to do later. And uh, so uh, for the visualization, we are using Plotly code. Uh, we are prompting the model so that uh, the skill generation part uh, is less complex and the Plotly visualization code is more complex. This uh, this seems to have worked better um, during our evaluation so um, and this is one of the things that we did and uh, this is uh, uh, so we also generate a sample data we uh, make the model speculate what the data should be and uh, once we get this sample data we what we can do is uh, we can start the floppy code generation part and uh, the SQL database querying like concurrently and this uh, speeds up improvements although like um, if there is error or 
and the SQL server query that it generates doesn't have the auto format that the, the sample data currently has. What we do is uh, once we get the SQL result, we uh, we generate we regenerate the sample data based on the actual data that we have and um, that fixes the issue and um, and we also uh, have uh, we also have uh, made the um, made the model so that it uh, loops back uh, like it generates the plotly code again if there is some error we are computing the plotly visualization in the server and we are just sending the HTML to the user so uh, the errors within the plotly code can be uh, the uh, not logical errors but the programming errors like uh, some syntax error or import error uh, that can be fixed uh, by the code uh, and and after that uh, the fallback mechanism is also implemented for the SQL generation part and uh, that's it for me so okay and i'm going to talk about pattern analysis in pattern gpt okay um the motivation that we want to do pattern analysis in in pattern gpt is because we believe that uh by analyzing the Analyzing patterns, we can speed up the manual labeling process or even create a automatically labeling systems. Uh, there are several uh, situations that we can do with pattern uh, analyzing. Like we can compare two species which have similar uh, patterns and we can find a specific patterns that will exist on different species in the same habitat. Or even we can compare two different uh, patterns that exist on the same species, but they live in different habitats. And our pipeline to achieve pattern analysis uh, is like uh, like this pipeline. Uh, first, we will segment the target from the background, no matter it is the single object in the uh, in the image or there are multiple species in the image. You can segment it with uh, from the background. And then we will divide it. Uh, uh, we will divide this image, this target, into different detailed patterns with different color. And then we will set up the database of detailed patterns to um, to do both of these things. The first thing is we can use blip model to generate description of these detailed patterns, or we can use convolutional neural network to search for all the species that have similar patterns. Um, we will talk about uh, several things that we achieved the goal. Like the first one, we use segment anything model, which is also called SAM, from made up to segment the, the target from the background. And in the pattern extraction part, uh, why we're doing pattern extraction is because uh, the like using the color to uh, distinguish patterns the easier way than edge detection or um, the other way that using GPT or using Wiki to separate the body parts from the target species. And how we achieve this is by image processing method that we use HSV value to separate the colors out. And we I will uh, hand it to Ink to talk about the similarity search. Um, hi, uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, so after we separate the um, color-based pattern from the uh, fish images, here we can apply uh, something like we use blip to like uh, generate descriptions, or we can apply the scene-based pattern similarity search. So here uh, we had a little demo uh, uh, that, that is uh, on the next slides. Uh, but basically, we use the same like uh, efficient net v seven model, and ge to generate feature vectors and use the user uploaded uh, image to generate a uh, invert inverse image search feature vectors and uh, do that search in our own database uh, vector database. So here, uh, 
I'm going to uh, talk a little about the user interface. Um, so uh, this is currently a work in progress, uh, but here we what, what we have already achieved is uh, when we click at the uh, image, we can use sand model to extract to remove the background. And here we provided three masks because uh, for different uh, pictures, uh, different masks can have different results. And user can we, we uh, here we just put different results so that us users can change uh, can choose their uh, the the most optimized one here. Uh, users can change the color range, which is basically uh, how many colors, how, how wide the color range uh, that user want to like uh, keep. So here is the multi object example. When we, when a user can click on uh, one of the fish, like here, and here we will upset. Uh, we will we will uh, zoom zoom in. Uh, like here, if I want to like uh, search for the uh, yellow tail, okay. So obviously, the we want the most color range to keep the tail as a whole. So uh, here is a different uh, interface, but basically we just upload the image. And uh, here we per we we use that uh, pattern image to search in our data uh, vector database. Uh, so. Uh, so to be clear, here the result is the uh, the the whole picture of the fish, but well, actually we we'll, uh, apply the uh, similarity search based on the pre pre segmented uh, pattern that we uh, use our uh, script to like uh, gen pre generated. Um, so here's a little future work. Uh, for example, uh, a more uh, a more appropriate way might uh, might not be just uh, simply use the color to uh, do, apply the, sim the similarity search. We can also uh, use edges. Also, uh, the next step of, of our goal is to uh, integrate the plane model and generate the description into the interface. Also, um, also the uh, the more general purpose of this tool is that uh, not only can we apply the similarity search on the whole picture of of the user upload, uh, but but we can also like apply similarity search based on parts of the user inputs. So I uh, we think that might be some uh, useful uh, use case in this way, and that's what we are going to talk uh, in the slides. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks so much um, to, to Amy, Nabeen, uh, Dennis, and Inc. for that presentation. Um, so I think you know we have about 15 minutes left in session. If you want to ask any questions in particular about Fathom GPT, I'm sure they'll all be happy to answer. Um, or we can uh, we can talk about anything else as well, right? Um, so floor is entirely open. Um, turn it over to you all. Um, uh, actually, we have, uh, oh, um, sorry. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, Drew, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, you mentioned in the, the last slide there a little bit about uh, the super resolution, I think it was, that you uh, are hoping to achieve with... Uh, OpenCV and some of the deep learning tools. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about that. Um, actually, about that part, we might not do a super resolution because uh, after doing super resolution, it will change the patterns somehow. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so uh, we've <clears> talked <throat> about uh, lots of uh, uh, very uh, lots of experts and. And the feedback is that maybe not doing the super resolution will be more correct for our result. So we will take that part away. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, you, you talked a lot about sort of pattern recognition towards the, the latter half of this. Um, 
the question came up in the middle or sort of in the at some point in the presentation earlier about use cases and um what types of things you're looking to do so it seems like you're <clears throat> excuse me you're charging ahead with the 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 pattern recognition portion of it do you do you have use cases in mind for researchers or you just think it might be a useful feature um the first thing that we came across that using uh, pattern analysis in Python GPT is like uh, we can we can compare to species and like if we don't know what kind of species the target is we can find uh, all the species that we already labeled and find if they have similar patterns and by finding similar patterns to find our related species we might find its ancestor or or some species that is related, and then we can label it. This is the first uh, thought of using pattern, anal pattern analysis. And there's and there's some other thought that we can, um, using pattern analysis to analyze a group of species and the relationship between habitat. Like now we're only, we're only analyze the patterns on uh, on the species now, um, including fish or whales or everything else, but we can also do the pattern analyze and on um, the uh, habitat, like where they live, and we can find our relationship between that. Like if, uh, like in coral, a uh, coral area, uh, fish usually to be very colorful, and my and with this relationship, we can throw to. Uh, automatically labeling system that we can speed up that finding the specific uh, or we can we can um, sh uh, shorten the size or uh, decrease the size of finding the uh, related species when we try to label the target. So this the uh, you're hoping to get better um similarity matching using using the segmentation um have you have you done any work with um looking at uh segmentation on substrates and characterization of substrates i mean that's um, not bounding box type stuff that's not fish but i'm i'm just trying to think in my head about what what pattern matching and and uh, segmentation might have to offer uh, um, excuse me, can you say the words again? I want to uh, write it. Down. I'm just asking about like, so a lot of times when we're doing dive logging, for instance, at my organization, Ocean Networks Canada, um, we'll, yes. when we start dives, we'll start, we'll do annotations about the substrate and, and the substrate changes quite dramatically between um, some of our various um, locations of our installations. So yeah, in terms of, pattern matching, I, I I'm, I'm curious if that's something that could be applied to a broader field or if you're just really specifically looking at what the bounding boxes are showing. Uh, we're not only used, um, to do a pattern an analysis, we want to, the, the, the other thing we want to do is do the discretion that where we upload the image and we can, we can generate a discretion of this image. So it's not only focusing on the bounding box of the species. We want to we want to that the GPT can set a bunch of words that describe this this uh, this species or describe the habitat or describe the relationship between uh, these two by analyzing the patterns, like the shape of the patterns or the color of the patterns. Mm -hmm. So. But right now we're trying to do the uh, the the easiest easiest thing. Now easiest thing we want to do the uh, similarity search first, so we extract okay. the pattern out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, just to chime in on that. I mean, I, I think a lot of this depends on having you know already some collection of um, you know annotated data to compare against, right? That you can uh, compute these features out of. <clears throat> um, and currently, we don't have anything about substrates in FathomNet, um, though, I mean, we could imagine, you know, a scenario down the road where we, where we would have um, substrate information included there and annotated. Um, but yeah, like as of now, we don't have any um, substrates, so it'd be, it might be difficult to 
um, to have that. Of course, you know, you could imagine using SAM or something to, to be able to segment out, um, you know, maybe the background behind the things that you're actually um, already segmenting out, right? And then you could uh, include that as a sort of uh, separate annotation and then extract features of that, um, you know, spitballing here. But uh, I would imagine things like this could be um, could be within reach. Yeah, it's not something you're specifically working on or right now you're focused on pattern matching with bounding box identifications, mainly to, um, I guess, to do correlations and, and associations with other, other images. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So yeah, Dennis, I know you had a, another question that I, I cut you off before. Did you wanna? Um, yeah, I'm I'm real so really curious about that. Uh, what we can do with pattern and analysis in this whole system. Like we can, we definitely just don't want it to be a like simil similarity with a search. Like uh, it comes my it has come to came to my mind that we can use pattern analysis to target a uh, individual like we can compare an individual by uh analyzing the the patterns on on it and we can like uh track list species to to the image we we obtain from the from a, uh uh from the machine that you take the photos in in the ocean but uh, by doing this we can we can track the species, like how it move or how they uh, go around in this area. So I'm not sure, can we do that by only just like using pattern analysis or we're analyzing the two species to to find out, oh, this is the the individual that we're looking for. And we can we can then map out that where it, uh, where it traveled and then what is the, the path that he traveled. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, my my initial reaction to that might be it it might be pretty difficult to um, get pattern matching granular enough uh, and to be really focusing on um, really that the really high frequency features that uh, you need in order to to match two different uh, you know observations of the same individual, um, though. Yeah, I mean, I, it could be possible, right? Anything's possible. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I think you'd have to um, reframe reframe this problem a, a little bit. Um, though, yeah, I mean, I think Angus was showing an example of you know uh, some some sea turtles that that have you know very distinct features that that you could do, but you might need to include some more structural information and not necessarily just like these um, uh, these deep features that you can you can extract. Um, I'm not sure. That's my initial reaction. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, about five more minutes in this session before we head back into the main session. Um, anybody else have any questions, discussion topics? I don't know. I'm always curious to know what um, your your use case is for FathomNet, and um, maybe you know in this case what you might see yourself using Fathom GPT for. Um, I don't know. Floor's open. All right. Well, I don't want to monopolize the floor here, but I'll ask another right. question. Please do. Um, the 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 uh, overall presentations are really great. We're excited about working with you guys. I think you know that. Um, the the work we're, where we've seen so far is very much um, with uh, sort of the image portion of the recognition, the pattern matching. Um, the, there wasn't too much talked about in terms of the uh, video um, aspect of things. So how is that expected to evolve? And are, are there additional video capabilities that we can tap into or our developers can tap into at this point? Yeah, so I would say at this point, um, not so much, but really where we are focusing all of our effort on video is within the Ocean Vision AI portal. Um, so that is going to have you know, from the get go and, and already has, as, as far as I'm aware, a lot of functionality for doing detection and tracking 
um, as well as like tracking corrections and things like that. So they're they're working on you know views to be able to look at model outputs from a tracking system um, on top of of a um, you know just just the still frame imagery. Um, I think in FathomNet we're for now what we're doing is limiting the scope to images. Um, but uh, yes, so in uh, in the portal it will be more video first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you're aware we obviously can extract images from our video, but, uh, you know, having some of the capabilities to do real-time uh, annotations in, in video would be super interesting to us. So I'm looking forward to see that, seeing that aspect, uh, continue to develop. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, in fact, I mean, we have been doing, um, you know, some work in related projects, um, so there's, there's, if you'll check it on the model zoo, there's the uh, Embari midwater uh, detector, which is mm -hmm. uh, we've deployed on, uh, you know, actually in real time um, using an ROV that we've, we've basically sent the video stream back up to the ship and then, um, you know, run a detection and tracking system online and then use that to actually inform vehicle behavior. So uh, mm -hmm. you know, controlling the vehicle based on that. So I think there's, there's definitely some, some inroads there. Um, mm -hmm. Though I I would argue that the majority of our work to date has been on um, you know these offline uh, more uh, looking at these large collections of video and then processing those through to get um, you know uh, population estimates things like this. Okay. Sounds but, good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Isaac, I see you have a comment. Real-time annotations would be useful for you to, as well. What's uh, what's your use case in particular? Oh, no worries. Well, we may uh, we need to re revisit that. Um, I know we just have about one more minute until we have to hop back into the main session, but would be curious to know um, what, you're, what you're doing in that avenue as well. Yeah. Maybe save save what you got typed there, and then uh, then maybe send it to me. And when we hop back in, I'm gonna have to uh, stop the recording now, and then uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll rejoin. Uh, but thanks everybody, and um, thanks to everybody for presenting, and I'll see you back there. Thanks, Kevin.